And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. Jesus is in his hometown, Nazareth, speaking at the synagogue. This is the very beginning of his ministry, and he has just basically stated for everyone what is his mission. Then he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. He said, is this not, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. There was also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed except Naaman of the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up drove him out of town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So here's an idea for your next holiday meal when all the, when all the family is gathered. Don't talk politics, just ask the question, so who was the favorite? And see what happens. Years ago, I helped two churches merge together, the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church in Wharton, New Jersey, merged together. And I was the Presbyterian pastor helping that happen. And in that process, I kept saying things like, it needs to, you know, we need to be really good about making sure there's the same number of Presbyterians as Methodists on, on the leadership board. And, and when we're doing this, there need to be the same number and everything needs to appear fair. And the other pastor was, I don't know, Robin, you know, these are good people, you know, they're adults, it'll be fine. And I kept thinking and saying, I, I think you're giving them too much credit. <laughs> and I went to a continuing education event and I ran into somebody that I went to seminary with and we we're talking about our churches and our context and I was expressing some frustration and my friend asked me is is he an only child and I went yeah and she said he doesn't understand sibling rivalry and I went oh ding 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 we have a winner he never had to fight for the front seat of the car he never you know heard the heard the lines you know it's not fair why does he get why does she get just be, this is me, just because she's 18 months older, why does she get to stay up later? That's not fair, right? I remember a Bible study in my first church and the theme was blessing. And it, and it focused on the, stories, uh, the story of Jacob and Esau, the brothers, right? Jacob was mommy's favorite, Esau was daddy's favorite and mommy helped Jacob steal the blessing from the older brother Esau. And the question was put out there whether folks had ever received the blessing from their parents. I love you, I'm proud of you. Okay. The stories that came out broke my heart. You know, of the, of the son who he said nothing. He goes, no matter what I did, no matter what I did, it was it, my brother could do no wrong. I never got it. Till, you know, until the, you know, till the day my dad died, I never got that blessing. And the, the service or the service, the study focused on, we get that blessing from God made known in Jesus Christ. 
that's where, you know, you are my child. Blessed are you. But even faith-filled people can be filled, uh, you know, can wonder, you know, who's God's favorite. We can act like siblings. And we can also, uh, just think of the, 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 the story of the prodigal son, you know. You're gonna love on that kid who wasted your money, who didn't care how he lived, and here I am, and I've been the good kid all this time, and nothing, right? We can be like that. Or we can be stingy with God's love. You know, you love those people? I mean, just uh, Jonah. Gosh, don't you love Jonah? You love the Ninevites? I hate the Ninevites. You know, and even at the end, Jonah doesn't move from that spot. But God loves them. Jesus enters into his hometown, interprets scripture in the synagogue, and alludes to Jubilee, which I talked about last week. And they are uh, moved to outrage. The people turn on him. And there are different theories as to why. So let's talk about those. Last week, we talked about ju Jubilee, which is kind of a leveling of the playing field. Every 50 years, Israel was supposed to, uh, to uh, kind of wipe the slate clean. Everyone starts again. Anyone in jail goes home. Property is returned. Uh, debts are forgiven. And if you're winning the game, you're not going to like it. I, I, I likened it to playing. Can you imagine playing Monopoly for 50 years? Lord have mercy. Right. But it's like, OK, after 50 years, you know, if you're in jail, you get up free. Debts are forgiven. You know, everybody, you know, the properties are returned. Right. If you're winning the game, you don't really like that idea. But if you're not winning, it's, oh, that's not bad. It was meant to be there's 12 tribes in Israel so that no one clan was over another. It was supposed to, to level the playing field. It's very doubtful that it ever happened that Jubilee was ever celebrated. But I want you to notice Christians, I mean, that when Jesus, his, his proclamation here at the beginning about what his ministry is about, is talking about money and property and the release of captives from prison, earth care. And you wanna tick people off, talk about money. You know, we love God but it's still like having money in the bank. It makes me feel secure, right? Pretty universal. Some people believe that there's just skepticism, you know, the outrage came from just skepticism about you know, who he was claiming to be. You know, isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? You know, I, I don't quite understand the outrage in, with that response to that. I think they could have written him off as just like the, the town lunatic, but that's another idea. And then there's the idea that, that the outrage is that he's choosing outsiders over them. You know, he says, you know, you expect me to do the things that I did for the folks in Capernaum, but I'm not going to. And just, you know, Elijah didn't do that. Elisha didn't do that. And they were outraged at the idea that Jesus was going to choose outsiders over them. And that's where the outrage came from. And another interpretation I read which I find really interesting. Simeon, do you remember Simeon at the beginning of Jesus's life? His parent, parents, uh, Mar Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple and Simeon is there. The Holy Spirit has revealed to him that before he dies, he is going to get to, to see the Messiah with his own eyes. And he immediately knows that, that Jesus is the Messiah. And he proclaims to the parents, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The inner thoughts of many will be revealed. Jesus, the, you know, the, their folks are responding to Jesus. And then Jesus kind of says, well, I, kinda, I know what you're thinking. And that can be really uncomfortable that their complaints were more about a sense of entitlement you know, you're going to help those people over us. So now we're told at the end, they were so outraged, they took Jesus to the edge of town to throw him over the cliff. A couple of things. There's no cliff in Nazareth. 
But I think this is, I didn't read every commentary on the planet and I cannot be the only person who thought of this. But when I was reading this, I'm just like, I know why there's a cliff there in this story to parallel the, the temptation story that comes right before this. Right. So in the three stories, we're, again, we're at the beginning of Luke, we're in chapter four. There's the Holy Spirit at Jesus's baptism. And then it says, filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes out into the desert and is tempted. And then at the beginning of this story, filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes out to, to, to minister and to talk to people and to witness in, in Galilee and, and he's in Nazareth, right? So the first temptation, turn the stone into bread. And Jesus says, one does not live by bread alone. And then we're meant to understand, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And here we have Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit calling somebody. Yes. Her folks at home, somebody's phone went off. God bless you. Um, the, where was I? Holy Spirit, temptation, bread, word of God. Jesus is proclaiming the word of God in his, in his synagogue, right? So, oops. So we have that, that parallels the temptation. And then he's got the people in the palm of his hand. And then he goes that extra step and ticks them off. And in the temptation, you have Satan saying to Jesus, you know, look, this world, all of them, all of this can be serving you, right? And Jesus rejects that. We just serve God, right? And here again, Jesus' temptation is to tell the people what they want to hear. But instead, he's honest with them and uncovers their, the truth or their hypocrisies or the ways that they need to, to grow and stretch as people of faith. And then the third piece of that is um, when Jesus is taken up to the top of the temple and throw yourself down, right? The angels will, the angels will save you. And Jesus says, one doesn't put God to the test. So it doesn't do it. But here in this story, we have Jesus being taken to the top of a cliff to be thrown over and miraculously, huh? I think it lines up. Somebody else had to have, have done that work. But of course, in the reading that I said, uh, or that I did, it was, people are saying, notice the parallels here and what comes next, which is the, the reception of the, of the folks in Capernaum versus the folks in Nazareth. You know, all the same things, and, but a different reception. Anyway, what are, we, what are we supposed to do with this? Put ourselves in the place of the Nazareans or the, or the Nazarenes, either way. Ask ourselves the question, are we resistant to Jubilee? We are called, as we are blessed, we are called to be a blessing. Might that mean sacrifice? And are we resistant to that? Are we resistant to leveling the playing field? Are we resistant to God's love being for all people, for those people? And anytime you find yourself talking about those people, the Holy Spirit is whispering loudly in your ear, those are my children too. We separate ourselves, but God just sees all of us as God's children. So fill in the blank with your prejudices and we all have them. Jesus is going to minister to them because you're, you know, which is okay because you know that you're loved, right? And maybe Jesus assumes a little more security in ourselves than, than we actually have. Actually, the origin of Calvin's uh, theory of predestination was people, students were you know, worrying about, you know, whether you know, they had been saved, but then they were quite, could they lose it? You know, because we're saved and then we continue, you know, we find ourselves sinning and shoot, are we gonna lose it? So living in that place of fear and Calvin pastorally said, stop worrying about it. It's predestined, right? You're saved. And then people were, oh, well, if I'm predestined, does that mean I get to do anything? 
right? So then it got turned on its head and all, all the, the questioning about that. But it's, you know, you're loved. Not everybody knows that. And then there's this call to honesty, honesty with ourselves. Jesus exposed them and they were outraged. I was thinking there are times when somebody tells you the truth and you're like, oh, yes, and you're grateful for it. I want to say is that most often when I, when I have spoken with a therapist, I'm not sure, but when they say, you know, could it be? And you're like, oh, darn it, that's what it is. And you're just grateful for that insight. But sometimes when you get called out on something, you're not happy. We're not happy to be called out on our true motivations. And that can turn into outrage. I think, you know, we, we might be full of shame or embarrassed and that can turn itself into anger. And I think this happens a lot. And I think there's a lot of dots that we could connect from this passage to our present reality. You know, uh, people angered that they're not being treated fairly. People expecting to receive privileged treatment because of who they are and who they know. People unwilling to sacrifice for others. People not being honest about their motives. Feeling rage when they're exposed. You know, we could talk about and in different versions of the sermon I was writing this week, I expounded and then I pulled back and I expounded and I pulled back. We could talk about Black Lives Matter. We could talk about the Me Too. We could talk about the war on drugs. We could talk about voting rights for ex-convicts. We could talk about a lot of stuff. This passage speaks to where we are and who we are. And our discomfort might be the, same, the Nazarene's discomfort. And, and I was thinking about, you know, I was also thinking about, you know, in Nazareth, there might not have been any cliffs, but I, there, there are probably cliffs in Montclair. This is really hilly, right? I remember years ago, I, the, the church that I worked with, the Presbyterian church uh, in, in Wharton, the, the Sunday, I remember, I used, uh, used the story of Jonah to tell them that their, that their building was a dead end and that they needed to get out of the building. And I finally just said it, and then I did this. And then I literally, like, I peeked, I, for, for folks at home, they can, I peeked around the, the pulpit, like, you know, are there any arrows coming, you know, uh, the, uh, and I read this week that a very famous preacher, her name is Barbara Brown Taylor, she's an Episcopalian, she said, in a sermon, she suggested that they, the church use some of their mission monies to help an Islamic congregation that was trying to raise money to build, uh, to buy land so that they could have a cemetery. And she said afterwards, she goes, if there had been a cliff in that town, she goes, I, 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 you know, thankfully there was not. And that's how well it was received. But God will make us uncomfortable. Isn't that wonderful? Because we are loved. Because we are blessed. And God loves us enough to tell us the truth. When we're being selfish or prejudiced, or whatever, to grow us, to free us, to bless the world through us, to bring healing and forgiveness. And that's going to mean wrestling from our hands and our hearts and our minds, the chains that bind us and this world in the me versus you, the us versus them, the clan against clan, the nation against nation, the political party against political party. Jesus is keeping it real. Your faith affects how we live and how we live together. May the Holy Spirit guide us as we seek to be faithful to the calling that is being a follower of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.